All right, well, fantastic. Well, welcome, everyone, um, to tonight's colloquium. We have a fantastic speaker tonight who you're really going to enjoy. Uh, Dr. Samlin Buxner is coming to us all the way from Tucson, Arizona, where she works at the University of Arizona as well as the Planetary Science Institute. Um, Samlin got her PhD in teaching, learning, and social cultural studies at the University of Arizona just uh, not very long ago, writing a really, really thick dissertation which I strongly encourage you to take a look at. It's a great model for, for doing this kind of work, which we'll be talking about tonight, as well as some of the other things she's been doing. Um, Salem has, a, has a, a long list of, of accolades, including a master's degree from the University of Colorado. She spent a tremendous amount of time working at the planetarium there, in, at this planetarium there in Colorado. She also has experience working as a river guide, running down the, uh, the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon, which I'm very jealous of. I think that would be an amazing thing, thing to do. Um, but Sam has, also has particular expertise in, quanti in quantitative research statistical methods. Um, one of the things is, uh, as you're looking for outside committee members and you're looking for someone who really knows your statistics, um, Sam is someone who may well be the, the right person to help you out if you're looking at big data sets and really trying to tease apart some numbers. Uh, she has a tremendous amount of, amount of skills when it comes to research design. She knows the literature inside and out. Um, but perhaps even more importantly, um, she's someone who works really, really well in education public outreach. She's worked with a lot of missions, designing their education programs. She has a tremendous amount of classroom experience as well as outdoor informal education experience. And I think we're in for a real treat tonight. So, Samlin, thank you so much for being here tonight, and we're very excited to hear your talk. Excellent. Well, thank you, Tim, and I will be sure to keep my eye on the chat box. I will try. Um, I wanted to give you an overview of three different studies, and so these are three things that I work on a lot, and so I could show you some examples of some qualitative research, some quantitative research, and some mixed methods research. And so I'm just going to kind of scan through these three studies that um, have in common this idea about science knowledge and science literacy. And uh, it's partially my dissertation work, and then um, all of this work I still continue to do today. And so. Um, here are the three studies I want to talk to you about. The first is my dissertation work, which was looking at the impact of science research experiences for teachers. So that would be like the NITARP experience. Um, the second will be a study that we've been doing for several years, a study in science literacy and beliefs in science. And then the third is a study we just started this year, which is looking at where students report getting information about science. And just to give you the background, uh, science research experiences for teachers known by NSF as RETs um, are built on this idea that science inquiry is really important in science education. Of course, this now has to be reformed with the new science standards. We can talk about that. But when this study was done, uh, science inquiry was still a buzzword. And with the idea that uh, teachers need inquiry experiences of their own to be able to do inquiry with their students, the idea that we can't teach something we have not done, we can't teach research if we've never done research. And um, so these experiences are trying to fill in that gap. And I really wanted to explore what the value was of that, because we everybody who's ever done one of these knows they're really powerful. But I really wanted to understand what was it that was valuable and powerful. And just to give you a quick overview, teachers get to do authentic research. I looked at um, some biology and astronomy programs. I'll just talk about the astronomy ones. But a lot of the goals are increasing content knowledge, increasing understanding of science inquiry research, with the idea that it will then translate into student impacts. And so really helping students have increased experiences, knowledge, engagement, all of those things. Quick rationale, lots of programs exist. Um, they're very resource intensive. We spend a lot of money on this. Uh, Silverstein and all reported spending almost $30,000 a teacher um, doing this. So it's important. Uh, lots of evaluations. We don't see them in the literature. And we don't really understand a full picture of the games. And I really wanted to look across multiple programs to see if I could get some games across different programs, just not looking at single programs. The other thing, and this is a very qualitative study, um, a lot of the research that had been done previous, including several dissertations, were just done quantitatively using Likert scales. So those are the you know, one to five, pick your favorite number in there. And the Likert scales were showing a lot of ceiling effects, where we weren't seeing a lot of growth. They were already excited. They were already knowledgeable. They were already great at teaching. 
not a lot of place to grow. And so that was the methodological consideration why I made this a qualitative study, something I had never thought about I was going to do um, before I did my dissertation. So those of you thinking about your dissertation, I went kind of rogue, even though my uh, minor was in statistics. The research questions for this were, uh, how are teachers' research experiences uh, connected to changes in their understanding of science, inquiry, and nature of science? And it sounds like a few of you are looking at those types of issues. Then wanted to know how teacher research experiences connected um, to how teachers were going to do things in the classroom. I decided I couldn't fly all over the country, and so instead of looking at what actually happened in the classroom, um, I looked at how they described effective science teaching. And then I looked at what teachers valued personally and professionally. The two programs I'm going to talk about are the A. Ribsy program, uh, formerly known as T.O. Ribsy. These uh, are run by the National Optical Astronomy Observatory, and so it's an astronomy research-based experience um, where teachers do an online course and then come to Tucson for 10 days to do a residential program using the large telescope, so they still get to do kit peak, um, you know, get to stay up all night and be an astronomer during that time and present their findings. And then often we'll go to a AAS meeting and present. They can do journal entries and then they can always bring their students back, apply for time on the telescopes and do research. The second program was uh, the Chaco Educator Institute for Astronomy that was run by Sherilyn Morrow, who some of you may know. And this was all about astronomy and archaeoastronomy. And so it was a re week long residential program where the teachers actually got to stay with the astronomers and the archaeologists and do field work. And uh, in addition, they did some inquiry activities uh, and a final research project where they also presented their work. So we had our study participants. 92% um, of them consented. So you're talking about IRB, so um, got a fairly high yield. We had 17 formal teachers out of the RIBSI program and five faculty members. And then out of the Chaco Educator Institute, um, eight formal teachers, five informal educators, those who worked at uh, science centers and nature centers. We had a high school principal and then eight of the faculty members. To give you an idea about how I set this whole thing up, this was my methodology. And so uh, kind of looking through how I did this, we designed the study. I selected the programs. That's always fun to find a place that will actually let you come in and look at the program. I recruited and did human subjects. And then I started to revise my instruments and um, collect data, did all the transcription, show you my instruments in a second, and I got to my coding. Once I got to my coding, I had some emergent findings that had me revising instruments to collect. And I'll show you a little bit what that was all about in just a second. To give you an idea, this was all the data I collected for this study. So I had a science inquiry survey. This was adapted from the VNOS VOSI instrument of Liederman and Schwartz. Um, show you some of that. And so we did a pre-post on that. I also had a science teaching survey. That was about their implementation. We had a reflection survey. I was there during the program and did program observations. I looked at curricular products and research products as far as my artifact inspection. And then I did lots of interviews. I did interviews during the program, after the program, and over the phone, um, as much as a year after the program was over. To give you an idea about this uh, views of nature of science and science inquiry, I suspect many of you, if not all of you, are very familiar with this instrument. But the questions are these open qualitative questions. What in your, what in your view is science? What makes science different from other disciplines? Um, it has questions about experiments. Um, science inquiry. And so I adapted this mostly because the VNOS and the VASI both take an hour, and there was certainly not going to be two hours of science inquiry surveying to be done. And so I had to cut it down, and there is a pretty good precedent for doing that. The teacher reflection survey was all about uh, science lessons. What did they think was inquiry? What types of lessons? Um, did they enact that were inquiry-based? What type of research did they want to do? And this was, of course, related to how they wanted their students to be experiencing science and understanding science, all of that. So I'll just skip to the findings. Uh, you can always talk about um, the nitty-gritty. And I'm going to look over here in the chat window to see how much I've been missing of this great discussion. So Tim's talking about um, perfect, yeah. 
So I'm happy to share the instrument. It's in my dissertation if you want to see how I've shortened it. I was really nervous about doing that, but of course found another dissertation that had done that. And I talked to Renee Schwartz, and she said, just use the questions that are helpful, and then you can validate. Here are the findings from my study. Um, related to scientific inquiry nature of science, um, educators' participation in the science research shifted very little of their understanding of science inquiry and nature of science. No one's surprised, right? We're going to graduate school to learn how to be researchers. It takes many years for us to be good at this. And to expect that they would change in a week or a month or even a year um, is fairly naive, I think. Participants' background science and science research was strongly associated with being categorized as um, holding, holding mostly informed views. And anyone who's ever worked with the VNOS and the VASI, um, the way you kind of get categorized um, for each facet is either holding informed, naive, or novice views, and maybe a mixture. And so you have to go through and code. And so those who had already done science obviously were categorized mostly as holding scientific understandings that were fairly robust. There were some nuanced views. And so uh, one piece that was interesting is that if they had naive or novice views, they were often paired with changes in specific aspects. So they might have said, oh, now I understand a little bit more about the cultural nature of science, or more that it doesn't require um, double-blind experiments to be considered science. They were also able to talk about specific examples. So they could say, oh, I have this epiphany, and here's something I did on Kit Peak that helped me understand that. People who held mixed, uh, naive, and informed views made small shifts in at least one aspect. But the one thing that most people who still held naive views held on to um, was this idea that science is objective or universal, and the idea that experiments are the only way to gather data, which is very interesting considering that both of these programs were observational. So that's actually a fairly interesting uh, view of the nature of science. Just scan through this, teaching goals and outcomes. Their teacher goals shift from science content at the beginning, where you say, I want them to know a lot about science, to really affective. I want them to appreciate science. I want them to have done science. And we think that's related to the fact that they had a very strong experience in these programs, that they wanted that um, to happen for their students. And in fact, in the follow-up interviews, they moved much more towards trying to find those types of experiences for their students. They had mixed results as how they were able to do it within the confines of standards. Um, they shifted in their reported beliefs um, after the program. So they said they wanted to give students a more active role um, in using more teacher learner, sorry, more less teacher driven, more learner driven um, activities in their classroom. And they did uh, report using some more inquiry activities provided by the research program. But it had to meet their local context. And no one's surprised by that, that they couldn't just take the lesson as given. They had to adapt it to meet the needs of their students. To give you an idea, um, I did illustrative cases. And so I had a fully qualitative study. I had uh, almost 60 participants. And then I did um, six in-depth cases so everyone could take a look. And this is what um, illustrative cases looked like, where uh, each of the aspects of what we found were then, I would use the participants' words to describe how I came to these. And so here's an illustrative case of Erin, who's one of my participants. And she talks about inspiring kids to ask more questions, to know that they can be scientists, possess the tools to wonder, and get the answers they're searching for. So both of those affective and inquiry pieces there. OK, I'm going to keep going. Um, the thing when we talk about value, and so we knew that people found these very valuable. I wanted to know how they found them professionally and personally valued. And so they valued many aspects of their research experience, um, increased knowledge, their skills in, side, uh, in science, insider information. I now know what scientists do. I got the keys to Kit Peak. Um, they had experience. Credibility has been very big in the work that I do right now. Um, I look at a lot of programs, and credibility is huge. Still trying to figure out how that uh, plays out with students, but we know that it's really important to teachers. Professional growth, uh, personal benefits, and then improving students' knowledge and engagement in science and research. So they felt that they had the tools to now improve students' knowledge and engagement in science and research. What came out of this, though, is that there were a lot of pieces, as you started to look at the narratives, that they were so strong. So I've highlighted the words here that they said the experience is life-changing. Um, 
doing things they've never done before, help inform everything they do, and providing them opportunities. And so it was so powerful. I started to take a look at what this could all be a, a story of. It's not just about value. So she's talking about gaining credibility, getting a lot of respect. And I wanted to know, was there something else going on? And so I used a new framework. Um, and so I talked about an identity framework. And I had to go and actually talk to a few scholars about identity. I knew nothing about identity when I started this work. And I had to learn a lot about identity in all the different frames. And so if anyone's ever looked at this, you'll know that identity has so much written about it in the literature. You can look at G's identity. Um, what I ended up settling on is the Spartan Prusak model of identity. And the way that I describe identity is as a narrative. And so identity to them are the stories that, that someone tells about themselves or others to someone else. And that's what I mean by identity as, <laughs> as a narrative. And that's right. So yes, that is my theoretical framework um, for identity. And the, I went ahead and recoded all the data, the written data, the transcriptions. I'm using this new lens of identity. And I came up with five kinds of identities. One was as an expert. And so this is someone who is being seen as an expert from the outside. And they talk about how people see them as experts. The second was being considered a member of a community of practice. Now, you may know um, community of practice uh, if you are at all familiar with Laban Wenger's work. And so I did use it in that idea of being talked about that they were a member of the lab. Then there were some internal identities. As someone who can do science, that's very different than being an expert. That means that they had that internal narrative that they themselves felt able to do science, not just being able to be seen as an expert. The second was just saying, I'm a scientist. And they would use that language. I'm a researcher. I'm a scientist. And then the third was as a science teacher. And that kind of overlaid across all of these science identities about how they talked about themselves as um, a science teacher. And none of these identities were found in uh, just alone. And they were found in multiple identities. So here's a narrative of one of uh, my participants. And you can see his multiple identities. And he says, I feel that I'm not just an ordinary science teacher anymore. Students respect me more. Students have trust in me. I'm going to be a better teacher and a researcher because before I was just a teacher, but now that I'm also a researcher. The thing that was fascinating about all these identities is that it seemed like just being a teacher was not good enough. You had to be a researcher. And that was something I think that crops up a lot. Um, even when I just look at my PD programs that I run, that being seen as an expert is really important um, to their teacher identity. And um, that's something that I'm really concerned about as a teacher educator and something that I am looking at is this hierarchical nature of why you have to be seen as something more than just a teacher. When I take a look at the goals and the outcomes, this is really important, the facilitator goals. Um, the facilitator goals wanted the teachers to come out with increased content knowledge, understanding of science inquiry, students doing inquiry, and students doing research. And then when we look at what actually happened, right, they did get increased content knowledge in astronomy specifically. But they only had a little bit of change in their understanding of scientific inquiry. Um, they had an increased student inquiry. Again, this was self-report of what they said. I didn't see what was happening in the classroom. And a follow-up study really needs to be what's going on in the classroom, having some observations and talking to students. We did see some introduction of student research. And so that's something that was really helpful and has been exciting to see some of those uh, students actually engaging in research um, doing that. And then we did see some resources, credibility, and a change in identity of these teachers. So in conclusion for this one, um, traditional assessments don't really capture the impact of these experiences. This is really important if you're going to become an evaluator, that if you just take the standard Likert scale, um, a lot of these teachers are very high end already. You're not going to see a lot of growth. And so you really want to think about ways to measure or assess the type of growth that you might expect. Um, and so really looking at science-related outcomes also is a really incomplete picture of these programs. And so if you're looking for pure content or knowledge gains, you're going to be really disappointed, perhaps, especially if you are selecting teachers that are already on the high end of that scale. And the last is participation in these programs impacted teachers. Um, so we got increased confidence in teaching, 
changing their professional identity, and then increase student engagement in research. And that's kind of the take-home message of these particular programs. So I'm going to totally change uh, the topic uh, at this point, uh, unless there are any questions about that particular piece. I'm using my wait time. So I have a quick question for you, Salmon. And that quick question sure. is, so when you, when you think about RET programs globally, of which you know, there, there are many of them, you know, okay, Stephanie can probably put a dollar sign on exactly how much people spend on RET programs, but you said $30,000 per teacher. Um, do you get the sense that there are some characteristics that uniformly are a good idea or uniformly are a bad idea? Or is your study, because it's limited to your two samples, uh, you feel like that? Can you give us some insight on sort of the global picture here? Sure. And I can give you some insight, not just from these two studies. I actually work now uh, with a program in California um, that's been doing this for about six years. Um, I, we have a program uh, that's cropped up in Arizona. So things I can tell you that are generally good ideas are, uh, and no one's surprised, right, longer contact is better. And so these kind of drive-by RETs are bad ideas. And so things where there's a lot of support um, before, during, and after really make a lot of the impact because we know that it, with any professional development experience, teachers leave, they're super excited, they're going to do all this stuff, and then it just tapers off when reality happens. These experiences where teachers are engaged over a long period of time are really great. Also experiences that help them see how to use um, the research with their students is a really good idea. Things where you know they get into the lab and they get connected are a really good idea. Um, but you know the bad, it's not so much bad that you get the fly-by, drive-by uh, professional development, but one of the things is that you can't expect to have a really large impact. And for those of us that are looking at researching it, we know they're super impactful at the moment, but really where research needs to be headed is on student impacts. And so if this is the kind of thing that you want to research, um, along with all of us, uh, what's going to get funded in the future and what people are really interested in seeing publications are on student impacts of teachers engaging in this. Holy moly, and Stephanie says there's probably a billion dollars. Yeah, so very expensive programs. And that's why everybody's really um, interested in seeing um, what the impact of these programs is, is just because we are spending a lot of money on these programs. Okay, so I'm going to change, um, going to turn the corner at this point and talk about uh, this large study that we did. Um, totally different topic, and so it's all about science literacy and beliefs in science and technology. And so we think about uh, the public understanding of science, and this has been a hot topic since the 50s. And so we look at research of citizens understanding science has been active, looking at surveying of public and talking to people on the phone um, for a long time. Miller, who is now in Chicago, he's argued, right, he comes up with this definition of scientifically literate. And we could go around and everybody tell me what their definition of scientifically literate is, and we'll come up with a dozen different definitions. He argued that to be scientifically literate, someone has to have a basic vocabulary of scientific term and constructs and a general understanding of scientific inquiry. So what does that mean? In his definition, it means that you can read the New York science section. Right, that's kind of how he defined it. Um, to look at this more, in 1978, uh, NSF commissioned him and uh, another gentleman to do an effort to measure public understanding and attitudes towards science and technology. And these are these um, National Science Board science and engineering indicators. And chapter seven usually is about the public. They have lots of different chapters. It comes out every two years. And they always have a chapter about public understandings. And that's where this study got started long before I was in graduate school. It's been going on uh, since the 80s, and I was not in graduate school in the 80s. So this work is done, um, was started by a professor here in the astronomy department, uh, Chris Impey. And so one of the things we're super interested in is that even though it's been going on since the 50s, um, ongoing research into science literacy is still really big. There was a big report that came out um, from Pew uh, just a couple years ago, and the Science Board is still publishing this every year. 
We have a huge database of over 11,000 responses from undergraduate students um, that were enrolled in astronomy classes here at the university. And so it's a two-part instrument. Um, we have published in a couple articles I'd be happy to share with you based off of the NSF indicators. And so there are these kind of true-false items and some open-ended items. There are four open-ended items. What does it mean to study something scientifically? What is DNA? What is computer software? And what is radioactivity? And then a lot of basic factoids like does the sun go around the earth or the earth around the sun? Things that you would hope that a, a scientifically literate person um, should know. On the back are Likert scale survey questions um, about attitudes towards science and technology. Questions like should we continue to spend money on science? Um, then there are some other questions about astrology and different items. So let's kind of talk about how we dealt with all that. And just to give you an idea, uh, this was actually right at the WS meeting. Uh, it was still big. Are you scientifically literate? You two on social media can decide. So it's, it's a really hot topic. The research questions that we were looking at for this particular set of studies, and we've actually started rolling out, we just had a paper published in an um, astronomy education review uh, just this week, in fact, about this. And so um, how do students' responses to the scientific literacy questions compare to the nationally reported responses? So how are, we, how are our undergrads doing compared to just that public sample? Um, how do students' uh, responses compare to scientists? So we actually went and um, surveyed about 150 scientists a couple years ago to help us validate some of these questions and tether it to experts. Um, how at all does it, uh, does the sample of undergraduate students change over time? By that, it's not a longitudinal study. We just have these undergrads kind of marching through. And we wanted to know from 1989 to 2009, did it change knowing that we have a lot of interventions going on in our high schools? Are we seeing any change in these basic science literacy? And then lastly, what student characteristics are predictive of science literacy scores? Can we figure out if they do well because of their age, or how many courses they take, or their gender, or anything else? Those are the types of questions we were asking. Um, just to give you, again, an idea, we have survey responses now um, from 1989 to 2011. We have about 11,000 responses. So this is what Tim was talking about. I really like to work with large data sets. Um, interestingly enough, this was a pencil and paper survey. We got 98% completed surveys, which is incredible. Um, they were not being paid, they were anonymous, and they were in class. Um, no way really accountability. So that's, yeah, actually really great. Um, survey responses we did online. We recruited at the AAS, uh, universities, different places, and we got about 150 scientists online, which was 95% complete. So we were really happy about that. And the scientists answered a lot of the same questions that we had the students answering, but they answered some other questions. We had them ranking um, different terms related to science. To give you an idea, and this is right, over years of our methodology, is what I did with the data set is I did just basic descriptive statistical analysis. Right? We came up with a rubric to figure out how to do their science literacy score, and we just did it, and we have uh, all their science literacy. But then how do we deal with the Likert scale on the back? And so for those of you who are, are <laughs> um, well vested in your statistics courses, you know that it's hard to deal with Likert scale. And so we did a lot of testing of this to make sure that the underlying distribution uh, seemed normal. And so I went ahead, even though Likert scale are ordinal, I went ahead and treated them like they were scale and did a couple of factor analyses. So I started with an exploratory factor analysis to see what kinds of factors were falling out um, of these questions. And when the questions were originally done by Chris, uh, he had no idea what he was doing. He just wanted to ask questions about aliens and pseudoscience and religious beliefs. I did the factor analysis to figure out were these items actually clustering the way that he had intended. And so I did the exploratory factor analysis. I came up with a model, and then I did um, a confirmatory factor analysis, and that we say that's cross-validating. And in the end, we were able to come up with four decent factors. I'm working on the paper right now that explains how we did this. Once we had those factors, we took a look, and I did a, just a basic multiple regression to figure out if I could predict their science literacy scores. And so that's the way I kind of attacked these questions. And that's what we found. Um, this graph shows us how our, 
our sample, so our gen ed are kind of in this whitish color. Um, gen ed are students who've taken at least two science courses at the University of Arizona. That's how we define them. So how the gen ed did versus our freshmen, uh, we assume the freshmen have had you know, no college science courses, um, and we did define them that way. So even if they reported taking some classes at a community college, we considered them in PanEd. And then the NSF is the public sample. And this kind of gives you an idea about these true false items, how our sample is comparing to that public group. And you'll see, of course, that the Gen Ed students on almost every question outperform by a little bit. And so this gives you the percentage of that we're getting correct. Um, not too bad. Uh, antibiotics kill viruses as well as bacteria. Our gen eds outperform. You can kind of see um, that our self-selected group of people who decided to go to college and take science courses do outperform on everything. Um, that astrology question that's right down uh, at near the bottom is somewhat problematic. That is a serious uh, problem with validity. Uh, you should be looking at that going. People confuse the word astrology and astronomy all the time. And in fact, we did have a Likert scale item on the back that was all about um, the motion of the planets to determine my life, something like that. And there was not a strong correlation. And so that one we don't use at all in the science literacy. We treat that separately because we don't want to conflate our, um, at all our conclusions with um, what's going on with the astrology. And so that's uh, an item that the National Science uh, Board has kind of taken out because it is somewhat problematic. Here's some of these belief items, and you can see uh, how, then this is just our sample on these. They're a phenomenon that, phys that physical science and the laws of nature cannot explain. And so you can kind of see how that distribution works. Um, lots of people in the sample said, yeah, there, there really are. And so that was kind of an interesting um, grouping to, to see, was this something about pseudoscience, or was there something that is all about um, their horoscope? Yeah, exactly. Um, and so kind of going through and so again doing the descriptive, but these were the types of items that we did do a factor analysis on. And when it was all said and done, um, these are kind of the big findings. 2.8% um, of students in our sample answered 100% of the questions correctly. Right, so quite a small group answered all 15 out of 15 questions, and this was across 22 years. Um, with the mean right over there at 11.2, uh, just to give you an idea, right, that's about a C average, um, not unbelievable. And when I say there is no significant change over time, I mean there's no statistically significant change over time. And uh, it really was about 11 20 years ago and about 11 now. If you look in the table here, you can see we did ask them their majors and bend them into big categories. And you can see who the, the greater achievers are. Uh, second column over, science, right? They're doing a lot better. They're averaging 12.6. Uh, big bummer. If you look over the fourth category, our education majors, these are our education majors and our pre-education majors are doing the worst. And so the difference is uh, two questions. And we can ask ourselves, is two questions a lot? It's something we ask ourselves on exams all the time. Um, on percentage points, it's almost 10 percentage points. And so something we kind of look at when we see how it's going, that science, do, science majors do the best, education majors do the worst. Um, Interestingly enough, uh, the medical majors don't do so well as well. So something we're still looking at. Um, lots of people always ask why we didn't do ANOVAs and T-tests and things like that. And one of the things um, you should recognize is that uh, we have so much power in this group that I could get a statistically significant change difference uh, among anything uh, when I looked at it. So that's why we didn't do a lot of inferential statistics here because um, I could pretty much have a very small effect size and lots of significant findings. We didn't think that was the most helpful thing to do. To give you an idea about how beliefs in science literacy went, we were really looking um, at these, again, these four factors. You can see the four factors um, that we binge here on the left. So one is the aliens, belief in life on other planets. This is not aliens in the wacky sense, but truly in the belief in life on other planets. Um, Faith-based beliefs, specifically biblical beliefs. Belief in unscientific phenomenon or a scientific phenomenon. And then the last one is a positive attitude towards science and technology. And you can kind of see some trends. Uh, one of the things we've been looking at is 
uh, with the faith-based beliefs, if they agreed with more biblical statements, they did do about a question and a half worse on science literacy. So that's actually what's being shown here in the table is their science literacy score, again, out of 15. And so those who believe in unscientific phenomena also scored about um, a question and a half worse. But when you look at about general attitude towards science and technology, 11.4 versus 11.8, didn't really matter. They still, whether they were positive towards it or not, um, didn't really change their overall science literacy scores. Right, so interesting interesting comment here with Tim saying um, that Erica Offerdahl's work suggests that students don't think that finding bacteria is finding life on other planets. Luckily, there was no question about that, and so we couldn't conflate our astrobiology in there. Um, overall results from the study, um, demographic variables, again, we asked their gender, their year in school, how many science courses they had taken, um, their GPA, things like that, um, accounted for only 7% of the variance in their science literacy scores, which is pitiful, right? And so we have a very strong, I can show you that the regression works really well, but my R squared is only 7%. So I can say that we can start to attribute very little to the demographic variables. Um, the strongest single predictor was how many science courses they had taken. No big surprise. And that accounted for 3% of the variance in their science literacy scores. And then when we look at how their beliefs and attitudes from those Likert scale items um, predicted it, um, students' beliefs and attitudes towards science and technology were also not strongly related, um, had about 4% explanatory value. And so really the question is, from what we had asked, we can't figure out what is predicting their science literacy scores. We also um, are knee deep in uh, coding the open-ended responses. So for anybody who loves coding, uh, we've been doing this on almost 10,000 responses. Not really fun. I uh, have a few research assistants. But we had uh, all the coding about what does it mean to study something scientifically. Here are the items that are the concepts that were rated highly by scientists, right? Knowledge, evidence, experience, hypothesis. These are all words that show up a lot. To give you an idea, uh, the way we code it, we've been coding it uh, three different ways. We code um, using word counting, just a pure what words show up, a thematic coding, which I'll show you, and a quality response coding. So word counting, just to give you a really quick uh, look at how scientists answer this question and uh, how students answer it, things that are really important to scientists but not so important to uh, students, uh, things like experiment, hypothesis, really important to scientists, not so important to students, Ob observe, observation, things like that. Students come up with the word look instead of observe. Um, other things that show up, um, objective are really important to scientists, systematic, um, predict, don't really show up at all in our students' responses. Quality response coding, we took a look and coded them into one of four categories. They were off target, just had no, made no sense at all. They included appropriate words, like collect and analyze, but really, or we didn't have, uh, they used the word hypothesis experiment with a little comma in between. So we knew that they were regurgitating words. Um, it was a simple statement, collect and analyze data. So it couldn't just be words that it had to actually make sense. And then a more complete response that demonstrated understanding. And when we went ahead and did that, here is an example of the sampling. No one's surprised that scientists' responses showed much more understanding than the students' responses. Students were actually really good at simple statements, things that they probably heard in class. And then the last is this thematic coding. This is, again, based off of the VNOS work by Liederman. We went through and actually coded um, the students' and scientists' responses based off of all of that and start to see, again, uh, that scientists use empirical statements and reasoning a lot more than students, um, talk about hypotheses, talk about objective nature of science appropriately. They use data and evidence, um, think about systematic, tentative nature of science more than students do. Um, so going to the question where it says, I missed how understanding was measured. And do you mean in the sense, Stephanie, um, understanding in these open-ended questions? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the data and I'm thinking about um, Lederman's work and one of the, the, a couple of the criteria in there 
are that a person with a really developed understanding of scientific science would understand that it isn't objective to a certain extent and that hypotheses aren't always used. So by that measure, it's kind of like the scientists aren't doing as well as the students. So That's right, in a lot of ways, right. But then but the way we couch it is, can they also say that it's tentative? And so you're right. It's I'm sorry. What did you is, so can they also, right, can they also pair the idea that it's objective with this idea that it's also tentative? And so a lot of the thematic coding um, is not nearly as robust in the open-ended uh, kind of coding where you say it's informed. It's a lot more about coding those types of themes and then putting them together to say whether it is a well-informed understanding. Yeah, I think that that's the problem that Norm's group is having, at least when we sat down with them, is that a, a person's answer to one question is frequently um, like off-put by their answer to another. But this, um, in particular, those two, like the issue that um, that there is a that it's that hypotheses are used and that it's objective is actually not a reflection of how science is actually done. But we seem well, the more we talk to scientists, the more convinced they seem to be that they are always very objective. Absolutely, you know? and I think you know um, Renee Schwartz found that in her dissertation. Absolutely, right. So <laughs> I agree. It's it's a it's a tricky. Uh, it's definitely a tricky way, and we're only looking at you know a couple sentences they wrote, which is not a terrific way to measure, right? And so that's actually one of the implications, right? Um, so the first is that one of the things that we found um, is that pseudoscience and non-scientific beliefs are not necessarily at odds with functional science literacy, and so our students can regurgitate um, the answers we want to hear, but also have ideas and beliefs that we may not consider to be scientific, and this kind of irks astronomers because they always want to root out um, that astrology in class. They want to prove to their students that astrology doesn't actually work, and we've actually been able to show that students can give us the answers that we want to hear, but then when we ask them about their beliefs, they're, and they can be honest about that, um, they're still doing quite well. They're not failing as though we think they would be failing. The second piece, um, which gets at exactly what Stephanie was talking about, is that we really need to improve ways to assess science literacy. And so the way we assess students' knowledge of science through multiple choice and short answers is just not sufficient to know what they really know. But for those of us who have to teach large courses, what do we do? Right? This is a real big issue not only for research, but it's a really big issue for instruction. Um, and then doing well in science courses uh, without nuanced understandings could be relying could be related to knowing what words to associate. So our students, what we're finding is are really good at spitting back at us exactly what we tell them without having to undo a lot of work to understand science. And I think, again, as a lot of instructors and those of us who work in K-12 education, we really understand that. And the last piece is that we want to start to look at understanding interventions to increase science literacy, whether that's for the general public um, or for students in undergraduate classes, K-12 classes, and things like that. Um, as another note, uh, if you look at things like PISA, this uh, international program that's looking at um, assessing science literacy, the way people seem to be going, you know, the direction they seem to be going is through scenarios. Um, I don't know how much you've looked at that, but looking at scenarios and seeing how well people can do, um, and even the National Science Board looking at scenarios to see how people can actually react to certain scenarios to see if they understand science and not just looking for specific words, because you're right. The more we just look for specific words, um, we don't see a lot of internal consistency among a lot of people who do science. And then the last study I'll talk about really briefly came out of the first study. So one of the things we were really interested in is understanding, so we got kind of a look into the science literacy of our students. We really wanted to start to take a look about where do they get their information about science. Again, as instructors, we kind of have an idea, but we wanted to actually ask a whole bunch of students and really find out, is it really just from Wikipedia that they're getting it? And so again, the National Science Board conducts um, a survey to not only get their understandings, but they'll actually ask the general public about sources of knowledge. But really little research has been done about where students are getting their information, except just Two days ago, I guess this would have been uh, last week, um, Pew released uh, this report, um, which is the first of three reports about how teens do research in the digital world. So it's very timely um, 
that we're talking about this. This came out after we'd done our, uh, started our research, but uh, it's been very interesting. And so uh, I highly recommend if you're interested at all in this or you work with teenagers taking a look um, at this report just put out by Pew. What we did is we put together an online survey, again, uh, just recruited out of our large classes and asked them open-ended and forced choice questions to talk about their interest in science, their understanding, their engagement, and then really where are they getting their information about science. We managed to get 660 undergraduate students out of class uh, to fill this out, which we were really thrilled about. And this was all in the spring. Just the demographics to give you an idea, 91% of them were traditional college age students. So they sat in that 18 to 22 years of age, um, about half were male, half were female. And uh, you can see the graph that shows you how many college science completed. So we would consider um, most of them to be just one course in to our gen ed students. So we had a, an okay distribution of students, kind of on the lower end, which is what we were hoping for. Here are the big results as we get going. Um, more college science courses was related to a stronger reported interest in science and overall. That totally makes sense. I like science. I'm going to take more courses. Um, those who report having completed more college sciences were saying that they were more knowledgeable. So we did ask them questions like, how knowledgeable about science are you? And those who had completed more courses said, yep, I am more knowledgeable. Whether or not they were knowledgeable uh, is not really what we are looking at. So I can't tell you they were. Um, and then we asked them, has your interest in science increased, decreased, or stayed the same since you were in high school? And a little over half said that it had increased. Um, and only 12% said that it had decreased. So we haven't damaged too many of them uh, going through our courses. And so here's an example of uh, the data here, how knowledgeable are you about science in general? Um, right, moderately was the general response, and moderately. And that's probably not surprising considering that these were coming out of non-major courses. Um, we asked them about how well informed they were about recent scientific advances. Again, a little to moderately. And then this one is fascinating. How important is science uh, for your likely career path? And a lot of them said not so much. And the big bummer is uh, we made a big boo on this one and didn't capture enough about their intended career path, which is something we are now changing. Um, on their open-ended questions, uh, many other respondents reported the internet as the first place they used when they wanted to learn about a topic in science. Um, and then 8% mentions Wikipedia specifically, so they went directly to Wikipedia. Um, they did, some of the students talked about reporting knowledgeable people, like their roommate who is a science major, their professors or their parents, and about 2% said so they would look in a book. So that's a textbook or another book. Uh, really, it's kind of astounding when we think about the model of education right now when we have students getting textbooks. 70% um, of respondents reported getting most of their information about science online. So, not a, so you know, over half would go first online, but 70% said they got their information about science online. 40% said they got it from their courses, so they're showing up to class. And then 7% said they're getting it from books or TV. So mostly online and a little bit from courses. Um, but when we asked them who the most important sources were, they said teachers by far and away were the most important source of information about science. The internet, though, was right up there um, with their teachers. Wikipedia, really important for half the students. Um, TV shows, books, magazines, and even science centers, which we found a little bit surprising um, that so many of them thought science centers were uh, really important. And then when we talked about reliability, what was the most reliable source? Scientists, professors, and journals reported as the most reliable source. And so it looked a lot like this. I go online, but I know that the most reliable source are professors. So there was a little bit of guilt there that they knew that uh, they weren't going to the most reliable sources of information. And so the big implications is we're starting this, and we're just starting interviews now to start to revise our instrument and do some validity work, um, is that we do know, and now we have some empirical evidence, that students are using online sources of knowledge for science. No big surprise there. Um, one of the things that's been really big in this report that Pew just put out and what we're looking at is that we really need to help students understand um, the importance of credible sources of knowledge, which I think, again, as instructors, um, we kind of beat into them. And that came out. They knew that just going to Google was not the most reliable, but it was easy and something they did 
And then this idea of do students really think that research is about Googling a topic? And that's certainly what the Pew report suggests. And so lastly, when we take a look at um, kind of the overall implications, um, the first thing is that assessing science knowledge, beliefs, and understanding is not trivial, and it's not easy, and it's not something we can just make um, a survey and go for it and hope for the best results. Um, and the reason I say this is that we want to be really careful about the types of conclusions that we draw um, and the work that we're doing and uh, getting to learn a ton. And that's why you'll notice that a lot of people are going towards a lot more open-ended qualitative research. Um, even though it's really hard to do statistics on. Um, the second piece is that a lot of, there are a lot of nuanced understandings, it's very much like Stephanie was talking about, and that uh, a lot of students, teachers, scientists, uh, knowledge and beliefs seem at odds. They're not internally consistent. So we might see a right answer and a wrong answer, and trying to disentangle and figure out what that really means um, is a big challenge. And the last is that there are many opportunities to contribute to teachers and students' knowledge about science and scientific thinking. Um, there are lots of programs out there, but of course there is a lot of opportunity still to have an impact. And then for a lot of us who like to go in and look at interventions, there is a lot of opportunity for us to assess what's going on. And those are the acknowledgments that I have to put up. And with that, I will stop talking. And see if there are any questions. Hi, I actually have a question about the uh, first study that you were discussing of the about the RETs. The um, I think that's called does that stand for research experience for teachers? Yep. Okay. Um, this, this is my first time seeing, like, I'm familiar with the concept of RETs, but this is my first time seeing research about them. I've heard a lot of criticism about them before, and I'm just curious what you think of two particular criticisms I've heard. Um, one was that um, they don't really help much in the end because the, the teachers who tend to apply for them are already very highly motivated and very educated, um, so it's, it's not really um, affecting the teachers who most need that sort of help. And then the second criticism I've heard is kind of opposite, that, that they tend to attract freeloading teachers who just want a vacation. <laughs> and so those people don't care about the actual content, so it's not going to help them. So I'm curious what you think of those two criticisms. So the first criticism I think is a very interesting one. And I think Stephanie would say that um, she noticed a lot in the REU program, which is um, that the high-end teachers are the ones that are getting into the programs. And so there is this self-selection of really high-end teachers. And so the question is, does it do anything? And the thing that I'll say, at least in my research, is that interestingly enough, it actually helped in a very specific way. And so I even saw people who had PhDs getting into these programs. And so that's kind of an interesting um, issue that one of the things they said is they already knew how to do research, but they were learning, they were basically retraining themselves to another topic. So we saw a lot of biology teachers coming back to do astronomy. And the thing, they actually had incredible gains um, because what they were doing is they were taking their knowledge of research already and then engaging their students in astronomy research. Was it worth the amount of money we put in? I don't know. Um, but I will say, um, as a rebuttal, is that, yeah, we do get a lot of high-end teachers in these programs, but you still see some pretty spectacular gains um, with their students. It's unclear whether those teachers would have done it anyway, and that's probably one of the concerns about whether we are leaving out um, teachers that really need it. The teachers that are just going on a vacation um, didn't really apply uh, in my case because it's a lot of work. And a lot of the programs I look at, it's a lot of work. So if you want a vacation, um, the programs that they have going right now, you have to do lesson plans and curriculum and a lot of research. And so it's probably not something that they're well invested in because they'll have to do a lot of work to get into it. And so I didn't see that one nearly as much. Um, I did see a question come along. Yeah along here um, talk about the religious beliefs and science literacy. And so I'd be happy to talk about that. 
Um, when we talked about the religious beliefs, we were talking about on our Likert scale, we had questions like um, the, the biblical story of creation. Um, we had three questions on there about uh, whether or not they believed in creationism, um, whether, so really whether they believed in the Big Bang, um, whether they believed uh, the story of creation was true. And what we found is that the students who had strong religious beliefs did slightly worse, they had slightly worse science literacy scores. And um, when I say slightly less, on average by about one point. Um, as a group, they did slightly less well. Um, but it wasn't really a, a huge factor. And so even though we can say they did slightly less well, um, they still uh, had lots of students who could get very high literacy scores and still have very strong religious beliefs. I want to make sure I answer that for you, Ken. Okay, let's see if I can look in here. Talking about vacations. We're constantly looking at um, teachers across um, the globe and kind of who's doing things better or who at least appears to be doing things better. Have you looked at international tra teacher training programs? And if so, did they include um, research experience for teachers? And I think Arizona was one where they piloted a study with having um, pre-service teachers actually do research, and they found that it worked very, very well, and the teachers did translate that into the classroom. But I'm just wondering so about I, international studies. Yeah, I haven't looked at international studies at all, but I can tell you of a program, um, the STAR program in California that's run out of Cal Poly, um, does look at pre-service teachers, and they are seeing some really interesting growth. Um, they've been able to get some funding from NSF and Bechtel to look at pre-service teachers to see what kinds of changes and hoping that they can be a model for kind of catching teachers even before they get into the classroom and putting them into research. Um, but haven't looked at international studies, so I can't actually um, talk about that, unfortunately. Okay. Any talents we have with pre-service teachers programs that are too short in terms of research? Is that you, Tim? Yeah. And yeah, so a lot of the yeah, so a lot of the programs that they're running um, with John John Keller, who's uh, at Cal Poly, is running. Um, there are nine to ten week programs, and they try and get these teachers in multiple summers. One of the things that the group at Columbia um, saw when they they were able to even look at student outcomes, and so they were one of the only studies that has um, teachers whose students take standardized tests. And what they found, the Silverstein study uh, in 2009, is that after the second year, you start to see the growth. So it's not just one summer, but that the multiple summers really makes a difference. Um, to outcomes for students. And yeah, that doesn't surprise me at all. Sam, we are out of time, and we really, really appreciate your time and expertise and sharing with us and handling these rapid fire questions. And I know that uh, some of the students are going to be emailing you. I've already seen some notes about that. So uh, thank you very, very much, and uh, stay warm there in Tucson. Thank you.